Seated. Therefore, it is time for a question period. The member, uh, just one moment. I just got a last moment point of order from the Minister of Health Long Term Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I believe you will find that we have unanimous consent that all members be permitted to wear red ribbons in recognition of World AIDS Day. Minister of Health is seeking unanimous consent that all members be permitted to wear the red ribbons in recognition of World AIDS Day. Do we agree? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Now it's time for a question period. The member from Leeds, Grenville. Thanks, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Deputy Premier. For 14 years, this government has played fast and loose with the rules, bending and breaking many of them. The fact of the matter is, is that this Liberal government is untrustworthy. The Wynn Liberals gave access to cabinet, access to cabinet ministers and strong-arm companies that do business with Ontario for the benefit of the Liberal Party. They reward those donors by granting them expensive contracts and corporate handouts. Mr. Speaker, will the Liberal government stand with the people's guarantee and support the fact that we have to stop ministers from fundraising off their stakeholders? Deputy Premier. Well, thank you, Speaker. And um, of course, we've been talking about the uh, the people's so-called guarantee um, a lot this week. And I think we'll continue to be talking about it because there's a lot to discuss. So, Speaker, so far, what we've learned is that this is a party that cannot be trusted. They're, they will say anything to anybody to try to fool them to get elected, Speaker. The people of Ontario know better. They know who you are. They know what's in your DNA. They know you will cut the services that people rely on. Speaker. Chair, please. The proof is in the fine print, over $12 billion in cuts, Speaker. $12 billion in cuts. Answer. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Back to the Deputy Premier. You know, it doesn't matter what the Deputy Premier says. Clearly, the untrustworthiness of the Liberal government goes far and wide, Speaker. We've seen this revolving door of Liberal insiders to government lobbyists over the last 14 years. Just look at the uh, time the Minister of Environment let his right-hand man go right to a job with Tesla. The people's guarantee will restore trust by closing that loophole. Mr. Speaker, why won't the government lock this revolving door, the one that opens in the minister's office and closes in the lobbyist office? Thank you. Thank you. Well, speaker, what the people's guarantee will do is guarantee a cut of $6 billion in programs and services and another $6 billion in programs that support lower energy costs and GHG reduction, Speaker. But that's not all. That's not all. A signature promise, Speaker, in the People's Guarantee is a 22.5 per cent cut in income taxes. It simply is not true, Speaker. It is not true. Cutting one bracket by 22.5 per cent does not mean a 22.5 per cent cut in income taxes. It is simply not true, Speaker. So if the people of Ontario are looking for somebody to trust, they Answer. must not look there. Final supplementary. Again, back to the Deputy Premier. You know, this government should know their role. It should be to restore the trust between the people of Ontario and, and this place and this chamber. Our leader, Patrick Brown, and the Ontario PC Party will introduce legislation that will make government accountable. In that legislation, we're going to restore government advertising oversight to the Auditor General. ORPP, Climate Change, Hydro, there isn't a government ad they won't use for partisan purposes. It's appalling, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, why won't they restore the Auditor General's oversight role? Will they continue to use government resources to campaign? So, Speaker, what we've got is um, a $12 billion cut, a promise to reduce income tax by 22.5 per cent, which isn't true, Speaker. And in addition to that, we have the proposal of a carbon tax that will add 
$1,200 to the costs of families in this province. Speaker, this is, a, this is a platform we're happy to talk more about. As long as they want to talk about it, trust me, we want to talk about it. But just remember, Speaker, it's $12 billion in cuts. It's a bogus cut on income tax of 22.5 percent, and it's additional cost of $1,200 for every family without reducing GHGs Answer. one bit, Speaker. Thank We've you. got a plan. It's about fairness. Uh, stop the clock. As I have done in the past, I'll move to warnings. Particularly one side that was a little bit more noisy than the other. New question. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. The People's Guarantee promises the largest investment in mental health in Canadian provincial history. $1.9 billion earmarked to build the most comprehensive and integrated mental health system in our province's history. From what I hear from the government, they'll want to continue to attack us, but let me be perfectly clear. We need a simple answer from this government. Will the government back a $1.9 billion investment into mental health? Will they commit to the same investment? And will the minister sign the People's Guarantee? Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, of course, uh, to this government and this party, mental health is an I'll do it. A member from Leeds Grenville is warned. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, to this government and this party, mental health is an absolute priority. Here, we here. view mental health and physical health as being two sides of the same coin, Mr. Speaker, and there can be no health care, there can be no health, rather, Mr. Speaker, without mental health. It's that important, and our investments, including this past year, but going back to the beginning of our time in government in 2003, our investments demonstrate how high a priority it is for this government. We continue to make those important investments uh, across the province in a variety of ways, including introducing the country's first cognitive behavioral therapy program for individuals with mood disorders like anxiety and depression, creating youth wellness Answer. hubs as well across the province, and many other investments that our stakeholders and patients and clients are asking for, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Supplementary. A lot of platitudes. The Auditor General even said that you haven't improved the children's mental health system in 13 years, but of course you'll fight with her too. The biggest gap in our health care system is the treatment of mental illness. I know that too well. Mental health should be treated no differently than a physical ailment. Just look at some of the initiatives that the largest investment in political history could go to, directed to, towards Excuse me, stop the stop the the member from Beaches East York is warned. Another comment? I'll take it further. Carry on. Target investments into youth and children's mental health. We could have supports for those on Ontario's college and university campuses. We could have crisis outreach and support teams as a pilot project, and we could invest in mental health services for Indigenous populations through a preventative mental health system that provides culturally sensitive care. So my question is, will the Liberal Party match the commitment in the People's Guarantee? Here, here, here. Well, Mr. Speaker, we are making unprecedented investments in mental health across this province. But, Mr. Speaker, I have to say, when it comes to the People's Guarantee, I honestly was quite intrigued by the title of People's Guarantee, and I wanted to see if, in fact, it had been used elsewhere. So, Mr. Oh. Speaker, I wanted to understand the inspiration behind the People's Guarantee. Mr. Speaker, I scoured the internet, high and low, far and wide, and I kid you not, Mr. Speaker, I could not find a single reference to any other People's Guarantee, not a single one, until, Mr. Speaker, I went all the way back to 1893. Oh. And yes, Mr. Speaker, it's all been done before. You see, there, here is their inspiration. The People's Guarantee Savings Bank of Kansas City, Missouri, Mr. Speaker, a, a fledgling group of conservative-minded people, and I'm happy to continue. In Thank you. Stop the clock. <clears throat> You're adding, Minister.
gentle reminder. When the speaker stands, it stops. And it didn't. As I was about to say before everyone continued, the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs is warned. And I've got about five others that I'm ready to do right now. I asked the Minister of Health for a commitment, and he took me on a time travel back to 1893. Do your job. Here, here. We are asking for a $1.9 billion commitment into mental health. Yeah, David please. Lindsay, the President and CEO of the Council of Ontario Universities, had this to say, and I quote, Student mental health got a big boost this weekend when the Ontario PC Party platform included a $1.9 billion commitment to mental health. Kimberly Moran, CEO of the Children's Mental Health Ontario, added, so pleased to see topping up elementary and secondary school supports for services targeted at improving mental health and well-being, including funding awareness. Addictions and Mental Health Ontario tweeted a potentially historic investment for the province. So the question, Minister, will you meet that $1.9 billion commitment, this historic question. commitment, or will you continue to play partisan politics? Here, here, here. Here. 1893, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the People's Guarantee Savings Bank of Kansas. The member from Dufferin Caledon is warned. Mr. Speaker, a fledgling group of conservative-minded people who just months earlier had earned the confidence of their constituents who trusted them with their hard-earned money and their savings. Until, Mr. Speaker, only months later, oh, oh. after earning that confidence, the People's Guarantee Savings Bank completely ran out of money and were forced to shut their doors and close. Promises and trust broken, Mr. Speaker. Lives Shattered. Mr. Speaker, the parallels are staggering. A platform that embeds a $12 billion cut is Answer. just as doomed to fail as the fledgling People's Guarantee Savings Bank of Kansas City, Missouri. Thank People, you. I guarantee it. You seated, it, please. You seated, it, please. Thank you. New question. The Leader of the Third Party. Speaker, my question is for the Acting Premier. The privatized Hydro One recently redesigned uh, uh, people's hydro bills to include a message from the Liberal Party about the impact of their $40 billion borrowing scheme. Clearly, the Liberals still have enough sway over Hydro One that they forced the company to include campaign messaging on people's bills. Why doesn't the Acting Premier use that sway to direct the privatized Hydro One not to install prepay hydrometers that will hurt families struggling to keep up with their skyrocketing electricity bills? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, I'm pleased to rise and to reiterate what Hydro One has said when it comes to the prepaid meters, Mr. Speaker, that no, none of this, Mr. Speaker, will be forced on to customers. No customer will be forced to take a prepaid meter. It will be their choice, Mr. Speaker, if—and that's a big if, Mr. Speaker. The Ontario Energy Board brings forward and allows the, uh, the uh, application brought forward by Hydro One to actually come forward. So, Mr. Speaker, as Hydro One has said numerous times in the media, as Hydro One has said um, numerous times out in the community, and as I've said in this House many times, Mr. Speaker, this would be, if it passes, Mr. Speaker, an opt-in program Answer. for customers. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Supplementary. Speaker, yesterday the Society of Energy Professionals came out against any further privatization of our hydro system. Scott Travers, president of the Society, said this, and I quote, and actually I agree with every word of it. 
Privatization is a bad deal for ratepayers, a bad deal for taxpayers, and it puts the security of a life and death necessity in the hands of a corporation accountable only to its shareholders." End quote. Why won't the Liberal government listen to the experts, stand up for the people of this province, and re reverse their decision to sell off Hydro One? Thank you, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The um, broadening of ownership of Hydro One has generated $9 billion through the IPO, Mr. Speaker. Um, the government still remains the single largest shareholder of Hydro One, and rates will continue to be regulated by the uh, Ontario Energy Board, Mr. Speaker. But let's look what we were able to do um, with the money that we were able to uh, to generate from that, Mr. Speaker. And I know um, we kept the Minister of Transportation quite busy um, with that because we started off with 13.5 billion dollars in the GTHA with GO Regional Express. We're going to quadruple the number of weekly trips to 6,000, keeping, um, keeping uh, the Minister of Transportation even busier, $5.3 billion in the Eglinton Crossdown LRT. And I know $1 billion is also going into uh, Ottawa, the great city of Ottawa, Mr. Speaker, to help them with yes, LRT sir. as well. $43 million in Waterloo Regional Transit, Mr. Speaker. We were able to find ways to continue to Thank build you. Ontario up, Mr. Speaker. Hey, hey. Final well, Speaker, Mr. Travers also said, and I'm going to quote him again, privatizing a natural monopoly is never, ever in the public interest. I couldn't agree more again, Speaker. The private Hydro One has undertaken partisan political advertising on people's bills, applied for multiple rate increases, invested in dirty, coal-burning American companies, and is proposing to install prepay meters. This Liberal government sold off our vital public utility with no mandate against the wishes of 80 per cent of Ontario families, and now they're turning their backs on the damage that this company is doing to our province. Will the acting premier explain why her government continues to stand by this sell-off when we know that it was the wrong decision for families and businesses? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The only wrong decision, Mr. Speaker, was made by that party in the opposition voting against the Fair Hydro Plan that brought forward a 25 per cent reduction for all families. And for those Hydro One customers, Mr. Speaker, they've seen reductions anywhere from 30 per cent, 40 per cent, all the way up to 50 per cent, possibly, Mr. Speaker. Those are the things that we've actually done to help families, Mr. Speaker. And want to talk about helping families? We are building Ontario up. We're creating jobs right across the province, Mr. Speaker, by building infrastructure. I know I talked about some of the programs that have kept the Minister of, of Infrastructure busy, but I know, um, you know we're also tripling the Ontario Community Infrastructure Fund to $300 million, and that's keeping the Minister of Infrastructure busy, Mr. Speaker. We have made sure that the, the dollars that we have made, the billions of dollars, have been invested in making sure that we can yes, look sir. at programs, we can look at infrastructure, and continue to build Ontario up, something the opposition parties continue to vote against, Mr. Speaker. The question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the Acting Premier. Our hydro system should be putting people first, not private profits. And the same is true in our health care system. The NDP will put forward an amendment to Bill 160, the Premier's health care privatization bill, to mandate that private clinics, or as the Liberals now call them, community health facilities, be operated on a not-for-profit basis. Will this government support the NDP amendment, or will they just continue to support private, for-profit clinics, just like the Conservatives? Thank you. Health and long-term care. Sure, health, long-term care. Mr. Speaker, uh, I, uh, I know that, that the legislation is being uh, uh, discussed in committee as we speak uh, this over the course of this week, uh, and I look forward to uh, being able to continue the debate here in the legislature, including on Schedule 9, which is the aspect that the leader of the third party has referenced, that uh, calls for uh, greater oversight, uh, greater accountability, greater transparency, uh, and plugging any gaps that might exist where the level of oversight or the level of accountability is insufficient. 
uh, for those health premises that exist outside of the hospital environment, Mr. Speaker. Of course, we're not talking about family health teams or community health centres. We're talking about uh, places like uh, X-ray facilities where they do radiology. Uh, it's critically important that we have a regime that Ontarians can have confidence in, uh, that Answer. provides that necessary oversight so we can be assured of the highest quality care. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, privatization of our health care system is not in the best interests of Ontarians. But, but Bill 160 makes it easier for companies to open private clinics in Ontario. That's what Bill 160 does. That's why we are calling it the Liberal health privatization bill. And this government refuses to support, support our NDP amendments to make sure that all private clinics are not for profit facilities. People should not be profiting, companies should not be profiting on the health care of uh, Ontario families. Why is this uh, government clearing the way for more private for profit clinics instead of improving the, pu uh, the public health care of Ontario families? Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, I would welcome the leader of the third party to show me precisely where in Schedule 9 it does, according to her, make it easier for the establishment of private clinics. It does not, Mr. Speaker, and it eliminates the possibility of any future private hospitals. But, Mr. Speaker, we have had a moratorium this government for many, many years on the establishment of any out-of-hospital for-profit entities, including clinics, the alleged private clinics that the member opposite purports to be so concerned about. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in fact, since 2011, and I don't have the data going back further, but 2011, there were only five licenses provided, four out of hospital premises, all of them not for profit, Mr. Speaker. That's less than one a year and all for not for, for profit. So I'm not exactly sure. I su suspect that it is additionally her efforts to fearmonger about our health care system Answer. across Ontario. We are not changing our approach. We've had a moratorium. We're eliminating the possibility of any future uh, private hospitals, and we're bringing all these regimes Thank under you. a common, highly accountable system. That's Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, whether the health minister wants to acknowledge it or not, there are now a thousand private for-profit clinics operating in the province of Ontario because of decisions that Conservatives and Liberals have made over the last number of years. Bill 160, the Premier's Minister of Health, Long-Term Care is warned. Carry on, please. Bill 160, this Premier's health privatization bill is another huge disappointment for the people of Ontario. Despite everything they say, when this government has a chance to stop for-profit clinics and support not-for-profit care, they won't commit to doing it. Why is the Liberal government working so hard to expand privatization in health care, just like they did in our hydro system, instead of improving health care for people who need it? Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, I think it's interesting that earlier in this, in this week, including yesterday, the leader of the third party was concerned about the establishment of private hospitals. But obviously, she had another look at her legislation. She talked to her stakeholders, including the Ontario Health Coalition, and realized that she was wrong that we are absolutely clear in our intent to ban any future private hospitals. And so now she's moved on to something else. The leader of the third party is warned. Mary on. Mr. Speaker, we have defended universal health care in this province since coming into government in 2003. Yeah, we will continue to defend universal health care. Schedule 9 provides for a higher quality care, higher oversight, more accountability, more transparency of Sir? all of those facilities that do exist outside of our hospital system, many of which, by the way, were created by the NDP or licensed by, or licensed by the PCs. Thank you. New question. The member from Dufferin Calvin. My question is for the Minister of Health. My colleague, my friend, the member from Nepean Carleton, asked you a very serious question about mental health in the province of Ontario today. And you came back with some ridiculous story from 1893. Minister of Health, I want an answer. We want an answer. Do you believe that mental health in the province of Ontario sure. needs the support now, not in 1893? 
Mr. Silver, please. Thank you. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Mr. Speaker, our record on mental health stands and proves that it has been a priority for this government since we came into office in 2003. Mr. Speaker, we have increased our funding for mental health and addiction services uh, by almost doubled it, Mr. Speaker, since coming into office. Our plan is to increase funding by an additional $220 million over the next three years. We have provided uh, support and investments that provide for more than 50,000 additional children and youth to have access to mental health and addiction services. We are creating youth wellness hubs, which provide those wraparound supports. Mr. Speaker, we have created in the last two years over 2,000 new supportive housing units for individuals with mental yes, health sir. challenges, uh, the first ever in this country cognitive behavioral therapy program for Ontarians. Mr. Speaker, there's a long list, and I think probably everyone they opposed. Supplementary. You turned a question from Lisa McLeod into a joke. You laughed. Exactly. You were not taking it seriously. I don't know why. Why? Because she asked the question? Exactly. Because we, you don't think that we understand that mental health is a crisis in the province of Ontario? You were dismissive, you were rude, and you need to apologize. <laughs> Please. You see it, please. Thank you. Just to remind members, writings, and speak to the chair. Third person into the chair. There's a purpose for that. Minister. Speaker, uh, that party was talking about their platform, and I was talking about their platform, Mr. Speaker. I created a minister's mental health and addictions leadership advisory council when I came into uh, the, as minister of health. More than 25 individuals, the most exceptional individuals, including many of them with lived experience, and advocates and experts across the hospitals, in the communities, academics, everyone imaginable that would be able to provide the best possible advice to this ministry and to me as minister. And we listened, Mr. Speaker. Every year they produce an annual report. In fact, the next one is due shortly in the coming weeks. And every year we respond in a tangible way to the advice that they provide us, 2,000 more supportive housing units, youth yep. wellness hubs across the province, cognitive behavioral therapy, which was their number one ask, Mr. Speaker, yes, we introduced. We are making unprecedented investments. There can be no health without mental health, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Any questions? Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. New question. Member from London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Development. With the December 5th deadline for college tuition refunds fast approaching, the chaos and confusion continues. Faculty concerned about students achieving required competencies in a shortened semester are being suspended. Students who want a fresh start and their tuition refunded risk losing their program entirely. Students are being forced to jump through through impossible hoops to access the hardship fund. College Student Alliance said this week, we've been in contact with the government daily, shooting questions almost non-stop because there is so much left unanswered. Speaker, will the minister take responsibility and clarify options for students so that college students can make informed decisions about their futures? Thank you, Speaker, and I'm very happy to report that uh, students are back in the classroom, Speaker. Of course, had the NDP been in office, they would still be on strike, uh, but they are the overwhelming, uh, overwhelming program, Speaker. 
are up and running. Uh, uh, students are uh, uh, in the midst of completing their semesters. I want to take the opportunity to congratulate and thank the faculty members who have made this possible. Uh, there is, a Speaker, an opportunity, if students wish, if they do not feel confident that they can complete, they can withdraw, they will get a full tu tuition refund, and there will be no uh, academic penalty for doing that, Speaker. We did, for the first time in history, establish uh, a fund for students have, who have experienced uh, exceptional hardship when it comes to, uh, yes, uh, as a result of the strike, uh, Speaker. We will know more about that uh, in coming days. Thank you. Supplementary. Member from Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Minister, who could have acted long before the five-week mark to get the colleges back to the bargaining table. My constituent, Angelica, a student at St. Clair College, emailed the minister asking about this very issue and would really appreciate some answers. Angelica was part of a work-study program. She specifically chose work-study because these programs are very accommodating for students. But when she went to her financial aid office to receive compensation for lost wages under the hardship fund, she was denied. Mr. Speaker, when anyone, student or otherwise, is hired for a job, there is an expectation that in the event of a layoff, the employee will be compensated. Angelica was actually quoted in the CBC article as saying, I feel like I've been forgotten by the Ministry of Education. Question. Mr. Speaker, will the minister respond to Angelica's email immediately? And what plan does this government have to make sure that Angelica and hundreds of other students Thank will you. get the compensation they deserve? Well, Speaker, there are obviously many situations um, that, uh, that we are dealing with on a daily basis. Uh, the CSA, College Student Alliance, does have a specific point person in my office. They have been communicating daily. The vast majority of the questions have been answered, Speaker. We have we've worked very closely with students through this whole strike to make sure that they are front and center, Speaker. Um, I would uh, suggest that the member opposite, if there's a specific concern about a specific student, uh, first of all, they must work with their college. That is who is distributing the funds, Speaker. Um, but and if if uh, if my office can help, we would be more than happy to do that. Thank you. Your question, the member from Etobicoke North. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Infrastructure. I'd like to appreciate the Minister's 2011 long-term infrastructure plan, Building Together, and the diligent work that's been proceeding. This includes, Speaker, a $400 million expansion in my own riding of Etobicoke General Hospital, which will eventually quadruple the floor space. The 2017 long-term infrastructure plan is entitled Building Better Lives, and of course it embodies a number of the government's core values. These developments shape who we are and help the people of Ontario live life to the fullest. This includes, by the way, Speaker, a $2 billion expansion of the Finch LRT with eight stops in my own riding. And the Minister of Transportation which actually was in my riding yesterday, and we, together we made a related announcement. Speaker, I know that there are a number of details of the current plan, the Building Better Lives, and I'd ask the Minister to please detail some of those. Thank you. Minister of Infrastructure. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and thanks to the member for the question. Our new plan builds from a position of strength, $190 billion, the largest infrastructure investment in the province's history, averaging $12 billion per year, Speaker. We've carried out 100 major hospital projects, with 35 more in plan or under construction. We're investing almost $20 billion in GO Transit expansion. For smaller and rural municipalities, we tripled OSIF to $300 million annually and invested $490 million in broadband. In partnership with the federal government, we are delivering 600 transit projects and 1,300 clean water and wastewater projects. And we are the first Ontario government to invest in rural natural gas expansion with the $100 million program, which the Conservatives have cancelled in their plan, Answer. Mr. Speaker. Ah. Mr. Speaker, I'll have more details in my supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I'd uh, commend the minister on that array of projects that he's listed. In particular, I think it's important that uh, folks across Ontario have access to broadband. And so the broadband strategy and the related community pilot projects, of course, I think will have a material impact on the quality of life for people across Ontario. 
I know as well that the long-term uh, infrastructure plan also includes measures to make infrastructure greener as well as keep community needs at the heart of decision-making. The plan is going to guide our unprecedented investment in public infrastructure and make sure that we're building the right thing at the right place at the right time for the right reasons. Speaker, this is, as you might imagine, more important than ever as Ontario faces climate change, disruptive technologies, and an aging population. In my own riding, as I've mentioned, Speaker, whether it's the hospital, the college, uh, the infrastructure, roads, highways, we have an extraordinary amount of development. I'd like to thank the minister personally. Question. My question is, est-ce que le ministre peut élaborer sur My question is, can the minister elaborate in terms of the measures that our government is implementing? Speaker, our infrastructure investments support 125,000 jobs per year. And it's much more than bricks and mortar. It's an investment in people, and it's about building better lives. Our new plan announces a new broadband strategy and expands community benefits programs. It will phase in life cycle assessment to reduce our carbon footprint, and the sale of surplus property will include a social purpose analysis. In their last year, the Conservatives invested just $1.9 billion in infrastructure, not even enough for maintenance of existing infrastructure, and invested next to nothing in the energy sector. They promised billions in new spending, and buried on page 76 is $12 billion in cuts that they're promising the people of Ontario. And those are just the cuts they're being upfront about. Answer. Speaker, all of that is sleight of hand by the Conservatives. Thank you. New question. The member from Foreign Hill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the minister responsible for early years and child care. The minister is obviously very close with Martha Friendly, the founder and executive director of the Child Care Resource and Research Unit. Yesterday, Friendly said that delivering child care relief is, and I quote, a waste of taxpayer Monday, money, end of quote. Now, we here on the PC side profoundly disagree with Martha Friendly. That's why the People's Guarantee refunds up to 75% of a family's childcare expenses or up to $6,750 per child. Supporting families isn't a waste to us. Mr. Speaker, will the minister disavow Ms. Friendly's comments that childcare relief is a waste of taxpayer money? Thank you. Minister of Women, Fish and Child Care and Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I really want to thank the member opposite for this question because it gives me a chance to really talk about the amazing work that we're doing when it comes to childcare in this province. And I want to start out by saying Band-Aid solutions are not a solution. What we are working on here on this side of the House is working on real solutions, solutions that are going to transform the way we deliver childcare in this province. And that starts by building a solid foundation, which is what we're doing. So we're not doing these cash grabs, here's money up front. What we're doing essentially is a deep dive into those changes that need to happen when it comes to fees, when it comes to quality, when it comes to affordability. The plan coming from the other side of the House does none of those things. They're not doing anything to reduce fees. They're not doing anything to build quality spaces. Wow. They're not making childcare more wow. affordable. They're not doing anything for the workforce. We need 20,000 more early childhood educators. We have a plan wow. in in place. We're doing everything we can to ensure that we're building a solid system. We're not just saying that we're going to give people a certain amount of that's money sir. up front and that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Back to the minister. I noticed the minister didn't comment on Ms. Friendly's comments, but uh, respected economist Kevin Milligan did. And he said, and I quote, Martha Friendly gets many of the policy details wrong. Let me repeat that, wrong. Now, this is coming from someone who is close to a government that says facts still matter. Mr. Speaker, will the minister tell her friend, Martha Friendly, that she is wrong and that child care relief is not a waste of taxpayer money? Thank you. Minister? You know, Speaker, I'm not going to get into an argument about which person said what and you know, which uh, comment is more uh, on track than others. What I will say is this. When it comes to child care and affordability, we know well enough on this side of the House to trust the experts in the field. And that's why I have a, a table that actually informs us. It's called MEAC. It's made up of 60 different organizations or more that are really experts on many different 
different levels that are informing us about what they think should be happening. And the reality is this. The plan that the PC has put forward doesn't do anything when it comes to building the system. Wow. We know, in fact, that what they've chosen to do is recycle Stephen Harper's infamous childcare scheme, one that saw rich families benefit while middle and low-income families were left behind. Answer. Where is this funding coming from that they're talking about? They're going to cut out $12 billion, $12 billion out of the system. We are putting money into the system because we get it. Investments are how you build. Question. The member from Welland. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. After years of frozen hospital budgets, this government just keeps on cutting health care. Niagara Public Health now expects its provincial funding to be frozen for a fourth straight year. Funding has been pro frozen under this Premier since 2015, and as a direct result, Niagara Public Health is being forced to lay off crucial public health workers. As Mayor uh, Dave Augustine from Pelham says, this Liberal government has, and I quote, cut to the bone, and now we're cutting to the bone. Why is this government forcing Niagara Public Health to lay off workers who keep our families safe and healthy and our communities safe? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, we uh, absolutely value our public health units, the uh, hard-working health care professionals and all staff that work within those entities to provide uh, critically important care, especially on the prevention side, and, uh, but also help us when we are facing uh, public health crises like the one we are facing with opioid uh, today. In fact, Niagara Public Health received substantial new funding this year so they could hire more uh, full-time uh, workers to work specifically on the opioid crisis. But, Mr. Speaker, we uh, have dramatically increased our funding for public health since we came into office. In fact, uh, an in increase by roughly half a billion dollars, uh, almost more than doubling our Answer. contribution. And we continue to make those important investments because we believe so strongly in the work that they do. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, we all know that public health is incredibly important. They provide exceptional support for everyone from new moms to little ones to health and safety inspections to emergency dental care for our most vulnerable. And I agree with my local medical officer of health that public health deserves to get more funding, not less. But for four straight years, this Premier has frozen public health funding, forcing cuts of almost 2 per cent per year, cuts that our local councillors in Niagara call disturbing. Will this Liberal government stop acting like the Conservatives, stop cutting public health in Niagara, and save the jobs of our public health workers and the services that our families in Niagara count on? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Well, Mr. Speaker, we uh, increased uh, health, uh, public health funding last year, Mr. Speaker, and we increased public health funding this year, Mr. Speaker. I'm a public health doctor myself. I understand just how critically important that work is to our province, and we're making the requisite investments. Healthy Smiles Ontario, where almost 400,000 children benefit each year, that is 100 per cent funded by the province. Uh, our 180 infectious disease control staff across the province through our public health units, 100 per cent funded by the Ministry of Health. Smoke-free Ontario strategy, where our public health units are critically important in that work, Mr. Speaker, 100 per cent funded by the provincial government. We fund 147 nursing positions, including chief nursing officers, infection Answer. prevention and control nurses, and public health nurses. We provide 100 per cent of that funding. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to make those important investments. Your question, the member from Davenport. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister responsible for accessibility. Our government has made it a priority to increase accessibility and remove barriers for persons with disabilities. I have constituents in my riding of Davenport who have raised questions about what we are doing to remove barriers and make Ontario a more accessible place to live. As well, this coming Sunday marks the United Nations International Day of Persons with Disabilities. The theme this year is Transformation towards a sustainable and resilient society for all. Could the minister please tell us what this government is doing to support this worthy goal? Yeah, Mr. Responsible for Accessibility. Thank you. And I want to thank the member from Davenport for a very important question this morning. 
key to the foundation, Speaker, of a sustainable, resilient society, of course, is a strong economy. And our government has taken several steps to ensure our economy is fueled by people with diverse skills and talents. To that end, in June, we launched a comprehensive new plan to increase employment opportunities for people with disabilities, and it's called Access Talent. Speaker, we have five existing accessibility standards for areas including transportation, customer service and employment, and we're working towards two new accessibility standards in education and health care. The education standard in particular, Speaker, will meet a serious and growing need in our educational system. Speaker, with close to 400,000 students in Ontario who are identified as having disabilities, being exceptional or receiving yes, special sir. education programs, the significance of this new standard is clear, and I look forward to provide more information Thank in you. the supplemental. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, this government's stellar record in making Ontario accessible is undeniable. With the passing of the landmark Accessibility for Ontarians with Disability Act, or OA, AODA, rather, Ontario became the model for other jurisdictions to follow. Speaker, last month, the Federal Minister of Sport and Persons with Disabilities, the Honourable Cantor, indicated that the federal government has decided to cede to the optional protocol in the UN Convention on the Rights, rights of Persons with Disabilities. My question for the minister is, will this government commit to this House to join our federal counterparts in adopting the optional protocol in the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities? Thank you. Minister. Speaker, I am very uh, delighted and pleased to inform the House today that our government has officially given its support to the federal government on the optional protocol in the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. This is very significant. We are tireless in our efforts to make every aspect of everyday living easier for people with disabilities, and we're firmly committed to building on the momentum from the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. Our government is committed to making this province accessible by 2025, and our support of Canada's inclusion in the UN's optional protocol is a clear signal that our determination is unwavering and steadfast. Accessibility is a main priority for our government speaker and we are propell propelling a positive shift towards fairness and opportunity for people Answer. of all abilities. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Whitby, Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Deputy Premier. In it together, a report co-authored by Colleges Ontario, the Council of Ontario Universities, the College Student Alliance, and the Ontario Undergraduate Student Alliance highlights the mental health crisis, Speaker on post-secondary campuses throughout Ontario. This report speaker clearly documents the critical need for mental health supports and services for students. That is why Patrick Brown and the Ontario Progressive Conservative Party have committed $1.9 billion over 10 years to implement mental health services and supports across the province. Speaker, will the Liberal government match today the Ontario PC Party's commitment for mental health services and supports? Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you, Speaker, and, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. I think we all agree that mental health services on campuses, uh, the demand for services is increasing, and uh, we must be there to support students who are facing mental health challenges. And that's exactly why, Speaker, we added an additional six million dollars annually on top of the nine million we were already investing to bring the total investment to campus mental health to $15 million. I have to say I was very uh, supportive and very happy to see that those four organizations joined together to create one report that really shines a light on the importance of investing in mental health services for, uh, for uh, people on our campuses. Speaker. I'm proud of that initiative, but I know there is more to do. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, back to the Deputy Premier. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, I'd like to share a quote from a leader in Ontario's post-secondary education sector, and here's what she had to say. We're very pleased to see the commitment by Ontario PC leader Patrick Brown to increase funding for mental health services for post-secondary students. This is a huge priority on our campuses. Who said that, Speaker? The President, 
and Chief Executive Officer of Colleges Ontario, Linda Franklin. <laughs> Speaker, the Ontario PC Party will make the largest mental health investment in Canadian provincial history, $1.9 billion. Speaker, will the Liberal government agree to match the PC Party's commitment today and address the mental health crisis that exists on Ontario's post-secondary campuses? Please. Please state it, please. Minister. Well, Speaker, as I said, we're absolutely committed to improving mental health services on campuses in addition to what we've already done. One way that we are reducing stress on students, Speaker, is by taking burden, financial burden off their shoulders through the new OSAP. We know that money can be a real mental health stressor. This is an important step toward easing some of that burden, Speaker. But I have to come back to the 12 billion dollars in cuts that that party has put inside their platform. Twelve billion dollars. It is impossible to find that kind of money without cutting health services, including mental health services. So, yes, Speaker, these are guaranteed cuts. Thank you. Question the member from Nickel Belt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker. Members of the Sudbury community, particularly the Francophone community, are experiencing hardship and the loss of the services they need due to the prolonged labour dispute at the Sudbury Counseling Centre. Twelve members of USW Local 2020, all of them women, have been on strike for seven long weeks. I visited the picket line on Friday and Mr. Tim Wharton came to talk to me. Mr. Wharton is a survivor of serious trauma and a client of the centre. He's having a really tough time right now. He needs access to the care, and he has nowhere else to turn. Why is this government leaving people in my area, like Mr. Wharton, without the care they need for seven long weeks? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Attorney General. General. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I appreciate the question from the, the member opposite. She has spoken to me about this issue before as well, and um, you know we, we are of course mindful of, of the fact, Speaker, that there is a uh, there is a uh, labor disruption or strike that's taking place, uh, and, and then as a result, Speaker, uh, services are, are interrupted. Uh, speaker, the commitment, of course, of my community is to make sure that those very important vital services that are necessary for individuals who uh, who need these court mandated services or victim services uh, in both official languages, in French and English, uh, are provided. We're hopeful that the parties will uh, uh, resume negotiations, that they will get back to the table and are able to uh, uh, come to, a, uh, to an agreement because that's, as we know, Speaker, it is the best way of making sure that those services uh, resume. But the, in, in the meantime, uh, we are mindful, we want to make sure uh, and we are concerned as well, Speaker, uh, that those are service, important services are disruptive, and we are hopeful uh, that they Thank could you. resume as soon as possible. Thank Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. The workers at Sudbury Counseling Centre provide counseling, psychotherapy, employee assistance program, partner assaults program response, both for men and for women, counseling for women experiencing domestic violence, assistance for male survivors of sexual violence. They even counsel some of our youngest citizens, little kids, before they need to sit in as witness in the, uh, in the witness stand before a judge and jury. Nine of those 13 programs they provide are unique. They are not available anywhere else in our area. Can the minister please explain why he's leaving some of Sudbury and Nickel Belt most vulnerable residents and the people who depend on them literally out in the cold? Thank you. Minister. Minister of Labour. Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for that very, very important question. I was in Sudbury just last week with the Minister of Energy, and obviously this was an issue uh, that came up as we toured through the community. I can tell you in the province of Ontario, Speaker, about 98 per cent of all collective agreements are reached without having to resort to a strike, without having to resort to a lockout. The labour relations regime in this province, Speaker, is second to none. From time to time, Speaker, unfortunately, sides cannot come to agreement. That's where the staff from uh, the Ministry of Labour come in, Speaker. The mediators we have, the arbitrators we have on staff are amongst the best in the world. We have, uh, we have a number of mediators that are working on this case, Speaker, and I'm pleased to report to the House that the sides have agreed to return to the table 
in early December, Speaker. We know that the best agreements are those that are reached at the table. Uh, uh, negotiating by nature is tough, Speaker. It's supposed to be tough. Answer. And we, we hope that uh, if cooler heads prevail here, prevail here, Speaker, that we can get an agreement Thank that you. serves the people of Sudbury. Thank you, Speaker. Good question. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Energy. Ontario is well known as a leader in the field of innovation and new emerging technologies, especially clean and sustainable technologies. And just a few weeks ago, the long-term energy plan made a solemn commitment to Ontarians to continue building an affordable and clean electricity system in which customers are given more choices in their energy use, like with net metering. And so that show, Speaker, demonstrates that Ontarians and their families continue to be at the center of our plan. But, Speaker, the plan also talked about how innovative technologies have the potential to transform Ontario's energy system. And to keep up with these changing technologies, Ontario has relaunched the Smart Grid Fund, and it will support the growth and the advancement of the province's electricity grid in as smart and clean way, sustainable way as possible. So, Speaker, will the minister please provide more information to the House about the Smart Grid Fund and how it is helping Ontario Question. innovators and our energy system as a whole? Thank you. Okay, minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I also want to thank the member for Beaches East York for his constant advocacy for hydrogen and many other instances that uh, help us with our Smart Grid Fund. Um, Mr. Speaker, the Smart Grid Fund was launched in 2011 to support innovation in Ontario's electricity sector. And Ontario's innovation um, has produced a wide range of technologies such as home energy management, grid automation, energy storage, which is a game changer, Mr. Speaker, microgrids, cybersecurity, and electric vehicle integration. Through this fund, Mr. Speaker, Ontario companies have solved problems on distribution grids and utilities have increased their understanding of how the smart grid can benefit the system and their customers. Just last week, Mr. Speaker, Enerstore secured funding from the Swiss-based Susi Energy Storage Fund to roll out innovative behind-the-meter energy storage solutions at commercial, industrial and institutional sites in Canada. Mr. Speaker, I want to congratulate Enerstore and look forward to adding more in the supplementary. supplementary. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for the incredible work he is doing to help transform our electrical system into the future and to the best it could possibly be. Now, the Smart Grid Fund through it, our government continues to support jobs, growth and innovation. And there are tremendous opportunities, as the minister noted, with hydrogen technologies and other power-to-fuel technologies, mm -hmm. particularly around areas like smart electric vehicle chargers, and there's more. And a number of the previously successful recipients of the Smart Grid Fund and the products that they have developed are now gaining traction in foreign markets, including N-Dimension Solutions, which is a cyber security firm which can boast over a hundred utility companies using their services in North America. Ulti Smarts distribution system. It's a monitoring software that has been installed by over 140 utility companies. And there's a new transformer sensor, which is manufactured in Ontario by Grid 2020, Question. and it's been tested in 11 countries. So, Speaker, would the minister please inform the House as to how the government will continue to support local innovators through the Smart Thank Grid you. Fund? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, thank you to the member for the question. As part of our government's grid modernization strategy, now is the right time to build on this success by renewing and enhancing the Smart Grid Fund. That is why our 2017 long-term energy plan entitled Delivering Fairness and Choice committed $60 million, Mr. Speaker, in new Smart Grid funding, and we intend to launch a call for applications before the end of the year. This will continue our government's strong support of Ontario's innovation sector and help overcome barriers to electricity grid modernization. An enhanced Smart Grid Fund will focus on encouraging a culture of innovation within the electricity sector that explores new solutions for integrating technologies, tests new business models, incorporates electricity Answer. and other energy resources, and generates new ideas for advancing grid modernization. Mr. Speaker, I'm very pleased to be able to launch this Thank program. You. New question, the member from Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Deputy Premier. Mr. Speaker, in March of 2015, the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund gave $4 million to California-based Rentec to convert two sawmills in Wawa and Atacokan into wood pellet manufacturing plants. It sounded like good news. It was projected to create 60 jobs in these communities. 
In February of this year, less than two years later, Rentec closed the Wawa plant, and now they have the Atacocan plant up for sale. Oh, the money's News gone. coverage says the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund is asking the company to pay $2.5 million back, but Rentec seems to believe they have complied with their commitments. Speaker, will the Deputy Premier please tell Ontarians how this government is going to make sure this company doesn't leave Ontario Question. without repaying the money? Thank you. Deputy Premier. Uh, to the Minister of Energy, please. Minister of Energy. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Always pleased to rise and talk about the great work that's happening in Northern Ontario and a lot of the accomplishments that are happening thanks to uh, the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund. The Northern Ontario Heritage Fund is continuing to invest in creating uh, a diverse economy in Northern Ontario and one that's creating jobs. Just last week in my riding of Sudbury, when I had the Minister of uh, uh, Agriculture and Small business and the Minister of Labour with me in Sudbury, Mr. Speaker. We talked about some of the programs that the NOHFC has been bringing forward to help mining companies, to help forestry companies, we were down to help the, mine, uh, the, the movie sector, Mr. Speaker. We are creating more film and television programs in, in northeastern and northwestern Ontario, Mr. Speaker, that it's creating over 1,200 jobs. We are making sure through our due diligence, Mr. Speaker, that northern Ontario is continuing to grow and prosper thanks to the investments that this government is making for the North Northern Ontario Heritage Fund, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The minister didn't seem to understand my question. Uh, uh, this is not the first time that the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund has invested in companies only to see them leave before make their commitments were fulfilled. Earlier this year, Great Lakes Graphite left Ontario just 10 months after the government gave the company $400,000. Our leader is committed to penalize companies that take advantage of government programs and then leave town. Speaker, what has this government done to ensure future Northern Ontario Heritage Fund grants don't go to companies that are not committed to staying in Northern Ontario? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, very pleased to, pleased to stand and talk about the $100 million a year investments that we are making to ensure that the priorities of Northerners are being met. And since 2003, Mr. Speaker, the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund has invested $1.2 billion, which has directly created over 32,000 jobs across Northern Ontario, helping Northerners live work and build careers in the north, Mr. Speaker. Let's talk about a few of those things. We've expanded broadband to 100,000 more people in northern Ontario, $32 million of that, Mr. Speaker has been invested to support the expansion of broadband infrastructure into 21 remote First Nations communities. $6 billion invested since 2003 in our Northern Highways program, Mr. Speaker. Answer. Keeping the Minister of Transportation busy, we're continuing to finish the expansion of Highway 69, making our roads safer and bringing more economic development to Northern Ontario. Thank you. New question, the member from Windsor to come see. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question this morning is for the Deputy Premier. Good morning. The Liberals grabbed the headline, Speaker, with a rebate for people buying new electric vehicles, fuel-efficient vehicles. Well, here's a new headline. The Liberals are deadbeats. They're not paying their bills. Some new car dealers are owed as much as half a million dollars. I have a dealer in my riding that is owed $300,000. A small business fronting these guys over here who aren't paying their bills. Dealers front the rebate off the top speaker. They file the paperwork to get it back. And it takes seven months or more for that to happen. Seven months or more. And then sometimes they're told, oh, you made a mistake in the form. Start all over again. Speaker, Question. in the spirit of being open and transparent, when will these deadbeat Liberals start <laughs> paying the rebates to new car dealers in a timely fashion? <laughs> Thank you. Deputy Premier. Well, good morning and to the Minister. Never too late to get a warning.
thanks very much, uh, Speaker. I thank the member from Windsor for his uh, for his interesting question. Obviously, Speaker, our government is very proud of the fact that we provide generous incentives through the Electric Vehicle Incentive Program for those individuals who are both purchasing or leasing. The member from Windsor West is warned. I was saying we're very proud of the fact that through the electric vehicle incentive program, both for the purchase and lease of vehicles and also to support the purchase of home-based charging infrastructure, our government provides very uh, generous incentives. The member is right. There have been some challenges within the processing of, uh, of payment for those, in some cases dealers and in some cases individuals, uh, to receive their rebate. I can assure the member that the government and yes, the Ministry sir. of Transportation are working very hard to uh, fix some of the challenges, and I anticipate that the individual or the dealer that he's talking about will receive I uh, will receive the rebate soon, Speaker. I will also point out really quickly that all of this really and truly underscores how successful these programs act. The minister on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, uh, I'd like to introduce the family and friends of today's page captain, Sean Reynolds, from my riding of Burlington, Speaker, Stephen and Marie Reynolds, Jerry Reynolds, and I think Grandma and Grandpa, Kathy Murray Wertherick and Dave Wertherick. Welcome to Queen's Park. Yes, I'd like to welcome uh, David Swainer, who's a big contributor to the University of Ottawa. Welcome to Queen's Park. We have a deferred vote on a motion to second reading of Bill 177, an act to implement budget measures into an act and amend various statutes. Call on the members. This will be a five-minute bill.
All members, take your seats, please. All members, take your seats, please. On November 20th, 2017, Mr. Susan moved second reading of Bill 177, an act to implement budget measures to and to enact uh, various uh, statutes. All those in favor, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Susan. Mr. Susan. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Matthews. Mr. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Codd. Mr. Codd. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Manga. Mrs. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Domerle. Ms. Domerle. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Ms. Jasson. Ms. Jasson. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Ms. Nidu Harris. Ms. Nidu Harris. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Rinaldi. Ms. Rinaldi. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. All those opposed, please rise one at a time to recognize by the clerk. Mr. Fidel. Mr. Fidel. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Miller Perry Sam Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sam Muskoka. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Shibby Song. Mr. Shibby Song. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Madame Jelena. Ms. Madame Jelena. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Tabin. Ms. Satler. Ms. Satler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Shimanta. Ms. Shimanta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. The ayes are 46, the nays are 39. The ayes being 46, the nays being 39, I declare the motion carried. Bill, does he have extra do for Zedula? Pursuant to the order of the House dated November the 29th, 2017, the bill is referred to the Standing Committee on Finance and Economic Affairs. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.